After a while, this harmony of so many blues and golds begins to have a mesmerizing effect on the eye, and we become part of this quiet cell of light. This was Anna's own cell, where she kept up a regular correspondence with friends. For though as a painter, Anna Anka was the most private of all the artists at Skaan, socially, she was the one who bound them together. All art colonies are fraught with jealous rivalries. But the house of the Ankers in Skaan was a haven of peace where any of the painters or their wives would find a welcome. Anna's dining room became as popular a gathering place as the dining room of the Brundum Hotel had been in the days when her mother was alive and Skaan was still a colony in the making. In this house, her husband lived on until 1927. Anna herself outlived them all, dying in 1935. Fame crept up on Anna Anka uninvited. As a young woman, she was known mainly as the wife of Mikhail Anka, the subject of one of his most tender portraits. Yet, as an unknown in 1891, she painted a picture as enduring as anything the more celebrated men around her ever achieved. In 1981, a spacious new wing was added to the museum at Skaan, honoring the artists who had worked in this remote corner of Denmark a century earlier. The Skaan artists were mostly landscape painters or social realists, but one painting and one artist rise above such easy categories. The artist was P.S. Kroyer, and this is generally held to be his masterpiece, Summer Evening at Skaan. Two women are strolling along the shore in the most wonderful translucent light shortly before dusk. They are Croyer's own wife, Marie, on the right, and with her, Anna Anker, a talented painter and wife of the artist, Mikkel Anker. It's a painting which displays the full lyricism of Croyer, the dance of light and reflections on a tidal beach, the dazzling white of women's dresses, and the way these two pick up reflections and shadows. This expanse of iridescent blue, transparent where the shallows ripple over the sand, almost colourless where the tide has left a mere film of water behind, and the merest suggestion of evening mist so that the very air seems made of blue. Through all this, the two women glide like swans. And here's Croyer's extra gift. He has precisely caught a moment of conversation. It's a seascape, but also a study in intimacy. The turn of Marie's head is worthy of Watteau. So much character with hardly a glimpse of the face. She's the one talking. And this froth of white, Paris fashions, brought to a rural outpost of Denmark. That tells us a little more about her. The vast spread of sea and beach is painted as if it were a setting for two jewels, which in a sense they are. But it's also a setting whose emptiness draws attention to how absorbed the two figures are, how private their conversation. Their thoughts and words are as lost to us as their footprints in the sand. In fact, it was a scene Croyer hadn't witnessed except in this photograph, which he saw and asked to borrow. We can see how his imagination worked on it. Both women acquire an extra touch of glamour. He smoothed the sand, removed the clouds, and set them in this expanse of late evening in what is known in Denmark as the blue hour. He transformed a plain snapshot into a summer idyll. He was a romantic soul without appearing to be, like many romantic souls. The unflattering portrait is by Oscar Bjork. 
Croer himself hardly flattered Bjork either. He's the figure in the yellow hat recoiling behind the flamboyant Christian Krog on the right. This study of some of the painters at lunch is another of Croyer's masterpieces. It was Croyer's idea to decorate the dining room of the hotel where the artists were in the habit of gathering for meals, and he did many of the portraits himself. It was in 1882 when he came here to Skaan, aged 32 and already with an international reputation. He worked in Brittany long before Gauguin. He was passionate about Manet's work in Paris. He'd met Whistler in London. So Croyer brought prestige to Skaan and the richest of talents. He was relatively wealthy as well through success as a society portrait painter. There are photographs of him in hunting gear and by a trick of the camera, one can see him standing importantly outside the studio which he set up in 1893. The house is still there, a memorial to him. By the end of the century, he was painting lucrative commissions from America, group portraits of corporation bosses and captains of industry. But behind the public acclaim, Croyer's private life grew darker. He was already middle-aged when he married the beautiful young Marie. They had a daughter, but drifted further and further apart. Some of his loveliest studies of her are romantic idylls from the time when he was losing her, always against huge silver-blue seas which seem to emphasize the distance between reality and his own longings. It is always summer. She is dressed like a princess, and she turns her head, but not to gaze at him. She is indeed lovely, but melancholic. What Croyer sees is a young woman whose thoughts are not for him, nor her love. It was 11 more years before she left him. Not long after, Croyer, by now mentally ill, included her smiling with the composer she left him for in a final and sinister masterpiece. It's an imaginary scene set around the annual midsummer bonfire on the beach at Skaan, 1906. His ex-wife and her lover stand right in the path of the flames, the fires of lust, the fires of hell. And in a circle round the fire are others who share Croyer's shattered life. His sense of mockery has not deserted him. Professor Tuxen, painter of Danish royalty, determined to get the bonfire right and to be seen doing so. Other faces are picked out by the glow of those flames. The master of ceremonies dressed for the occasion. Denmark's celebrated writer Holger Drachmann, made to look suitably bard-like. The artist Anna Anker, the lady he'd painted accompanying Marie on the beach so many years before, a loyal friend. Anna's husband, the painter Mikkel Anker, a pillar of the art colony. Looks of wonder on children's faces caught in the glare. All eyes are turned to this ferocious bonfire, a disturbing metaphor of Croyer's life here drawing to an end. What remains this sad, loving detail? Croyer's daughter Vibson, who stayed with him after her mother ran off. Next to her, the artist's brother. And beyond her, the mother who had already left Skaan three years before, with her new husband, Hugo Alfvén, by whom she had a further child. But Marie's life sank into deeper unhappiness. Her composer, Alfvén, abandoned her, as she had abandoned Croyer. In and out of hospital, the artist lived on for only three more years. Croyer died in 1909 at the age of 59. There's a danger that, knowing too much about an artist's misfortunes, we may see them reflected in all he paints. But Croyer was an artist with a magic touch, an eye for colour and light that mirrors a relish for happiness and a life fulfilled, both of which eluded him in reality. In his great painting of Marie strolling the wet sand on a summer evening, we can feel not the way it was, but the way he would like it to have been. This gracious swan he'd married, floating through the evening light as if in a dream of happiness, and yet, of course, walking away from him in this painting as in life.
We know that the woman she walks with, Anna Anka, was Marie's confidant. And we know from Anna of Croyer's conviction that the happiness and good fortune given to him would be plucked from him. So in all his paintings of her, she walks away, or looks away. She wanted passion and love, not fatalism and self-pity. She became as tragic a figure as her husband, two characters who might have walked straight out of Ibsen. Her beauty gave her two men who could only love themselves. The second wrote music about her. The first, P.S. Croyer, painted a glorious seascape around her. Back in the 1880s, this would have struck the art public as a deliberately perverse painting. An uncouth old fisherman asleep, his wife's head scarcely visible in shadow, an ugly window sash dangling in the middle of nothing. The painter certainly intended it to be perverse. He was Christian Krogh, a Norwegian. The sleeping fisherman is Niels Guy Heath, a favorite subject for Krogh and for other artists who gathered here in northern Denmark at the fishing village of Skeen. In Niels, the social realists found their natural man. The brushwork is rough, heavy shadows, a few flowers on a table. The fisherman's wife, Anna, sits knitting while her husband takes his midday nap. Krogh hides his draftsmanship under broad strokes of paint to emphasize the awkwardness of arthritic hands, the jumble of old clothes and tired limbs. Krogh wanted, he said, to make pictures something more than a decoration for the walls of wealthy houses and galleries. He wanted art that would arouse a social conscience. Guy Heath personified the worker crushed by physical labor. And as it happens, the year he signed this picture, 1883, saw an event that would have meant much to Krogh, the death of Karl Marx. The forceful personality of Krogh soon dominated the circle of artists who collected at Skeham and took their meals at the small hotel here. Krogh brought with him his passionate convictions, a lot of talent, and a certain fame. He'd once been tried and fined for writing a novel exposing the evils of prostitution. Here he is, the figure on the right with the explosive beard, holding forth. The other artists around him, patiently listening, waiting to go, one suspects. The picture's not without a touch of mockery. It's the work of the most gifted of all the painters at Skeen, Peter Croyer, whose talk was as free of ideological rhetoric as Krogh's was stuffed with it. Croyer views him with an eye not altogether respectful, opinions flowing on a tide of whiskers. Croyer painted a good many of the artists who came to Skeen. It was his idea that they should leave a permanent record of the colony in the dining room of the inn where they so often gathered to eat, drink and talk a great deal. Croyer had spent some time in France and he had seen how French painters escaping from the metropolis, had decorated the country inns where they stayed, often instead of paying their bills. The landlord, Dane Brundum, whose sister was married to one of the artists, readily agreed. Today, the entire dining room is enshrined as part of the Skeen Museum, very much quieter than it ever used to be. For the dining room of the Brundum Hotel, Croyer painted Krogh in a more formal pose, beard combed, Rhetoric replaced by a cigar, a patriarchal figure. Krogh, the theorist and ideologue, was nonetheless a quite unrhetorical painter, and his social realism contains not a grain of sentimentality. When he painted the old fisherman resting, Neil Skyheath, he put down simply what he saw, an exhausted figure slumped in sleep. One arm resting under the head, the face ugly and screwed up, but not grotesque. The heavy body hardly described at all. 
a dark blue mass. And those arthritic hands of his wife, knitting quietly until her husband wakes. The longer you look at this picture, the more you see how it divides into solid chunks of light and dark, with just a few warm touches of colour. A delightful still life in sun and shadow. The fisherman's pipe, which he'll cram into his mouth as soon as he wakes. From very close, the features begin to dissolve into a scumble of paint, skin burnt by sun and wind, a stubble of beard. And watching him, we can at last pick out the profile of his wife, Anna, a face that's lost the habit of smiling, like an old carving. How the power of it grows, you begin to feel the weight of those two still bodies and feel the intense silence, though perhaps he snores. Crowe wrote about his fascination for fishermen in a letter to a friend. They're a race of their own, he said, quite different in temperament and looks from other Danes. Their language is like Norwegian, though they're more open, less dour, more sociable than Norwegians. A stranger may go into any home he chooses and look around. They make no fuss, continue their meal or sleep, or dressing without any shyness. But it was the fact that they were fishermen that appealed to Crowe. 